Seems like it's been a while since we've done this. Anyhow, here we are. We're back again. Trust you're all keeping well. Um, no, I'm not at home today. I'm here in the office. And uh, this is a special one from the office because you're unlikely to see it from here again because we're moving. And uh, by the time we uh, meet again, we'll be hopefully in our new home. More on that as we go forward and uh, over the coming uh, weeks when we're ready to move. But uh, yep, yeah, we're out of here. Anyhow, hope you got your coffee. All ready to go. Cup of Joe. I don't know why Americans call it Cup of Joe. If anybody knows, shoot us a comment. No idea. And of course, a bit of morning tea. Look at that. Blueberry muffins, strawberries, and peanuts. Yeah, the strawberries are really nice at the moment. Great. There you go. Enough of that. Trust you're keeping well. Um, and uh, good to see we're slowly all coming out of our COVID lockdowns and trying to find where that new normal is. Um, I know how difficult it's been for many, many people. And uh, they're right around the country. And uh, so fingers crossed, uh, we're getting towards Christmas. We'll take a, have a bit of a break, catch our breath and uh, go again for 2022. Imagine that, 2022, goodness. Be honest before we know it. Anyhow, before we uh, start getting into it, I better say our uh, thank yous to our sponsors who have been really, really wonderful. They've been with us right through COVID and we've been with them right through COVID. Um, and uh, as we continue on to the year. So special thanks to ALI, Bluestone, Finstro, Prosper, Heartland Seniors Finance Insurance Advisor Net for your PI insurance, great people. On Deck, Fund Trap, Credit Fit Solutions, Affordable Staff, Lend, Pepper Money, Strive Financial, Effie, Double AMC, Amfin, and Travel Loans. How good are these folk? And of course, the other special mention we need to do in regards to our wellness program and ensuring that uh, you look after yourselves and your mental health and your physical health is our wellness program called the CCP, Confidential Counselling Program, available for FBAA members and their staff and family. Um, it is completely confidential. So we get no data. It's proudly supported by Suncorp, which makes it free to you. Suncorp pick up the bill. We love Suncorp for that. They're wonderful. And the professional counsellors are sitting there are assured. So uh, you need to have a chat to someone. The world's getting dark. I know what it's like. I can tell you what, I don't know why. And I think because I didn't take a break during the middle of this year, my, my anxiety levels have been off the Richter scale over the past month. I think I've been knowing the staff to you know, God knows where. But um, it, uh, yeah, so we all need to make sure we look after ourselves, self included. And uh, if you need help because things are getting dark and closing in on you, get onto that counselling program. That's what it's there for, for you to use. And of course, this week, tomorrow, is very special, International Men's Day. And I uh, hope you can join us if you haven't registered yet. For men and women, um, come and join us and uh, join our conversation for a couple of hours uh, tomorrow morning, uh, at, starting at 10 a.m. AEST, so 11 o'clock if you're on Daylight Savings. Join us, it's gonna be great fun. Just gotta work out what I'm gonna wear yet. Last year I went very tropical. Don't know if I'll do that this time, although it's a very tropical theme. Um, I might have to think about that. But yeah, we'll get to it when we can. Let's get on to why we're here. We wanna talk about open banking and CDR. And I wanna welcome our special guest, Jill Berry, CEO and co-founder of Additree. And uh, they are specialists in this area. We're gonna have a chat to them what that's all about. And Jill, if you wanna, share your camera and uh, switch your mic up, uh, uh, mic on and come and join us. And uh, we're gonna have a chat about what this is all about. Gay there, how you doing? Hi, I'm great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Ah, no, look, our absolute pleasure, thank you. Uh, it's always great when we can get uh, experts in the field to come and chat to us about things that are pretty specialized and especially when they're specialized and new um, or soon to be new. Uh, but before we get to that, I'd like to have a little bit of chat to get to know Jill a bit better. Well, for everybody else to get to know Jill a bit better. Um, tell us, Jill, look, putting career to one side, what's your what's your background? You, you know, have you always been in this area um, or have you done other things in the past? What What's led you to being here today? Then we'll talk about today next. Yeah, um, I've actually been in open banking only for two and a half years. It's, it's pretty new and I never really started or planned on starting a company at all. Um, 
Um, but my my background's always been in product development and banking. So I love going from zero to one. So just having an idea, figuring out how do we solve a problem? Who is this for? Um, how is this better? You know, how can we create better experiences for our customers, whether it's our you know brokers or distributors or the actual consumers themselves? Um, and then actually working with designers, engineers, testers, and go to market with it. So I've done that for um, deposit products, loan products, cards, payments, and for consumers, institutions, and, and businesses as well. So I like to think that I'm a pretty good problem solver with product development. That's like what what banks have you worked in? You say being uh, yeah, um, going back, I was on the founding team of Volt Bank. Um, before that, was with Tyro um, on their journey from going from an acquirer to um, uh, an acquirer to a bank. Um, before starting a bank, got really cool. <laughs> um, and then was at AMP Bank for four years, and um, was at Macquarie for a little bit as well. Very good. Well, we, I, I know Mr. Weston at Bold extremely well. He and I go a long way back. And uh, you said Tyro as well. You're at. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, my brother-in-law was heavily involved in uh, getting that up and run it on the technology side. He was a a, a programming engineer. So. Uh, we may we may have some common uh, friends in the past here somewhere. Um, I'm sure we do. A bunch of my engineers are all ex Tyro as well. So yeah, excellent, excellent. And so tell me, what do you do to relax? Um, banking, yeah, yeah, <laughs> open banking really relaxing. Um, <laughs> but no, I I live in Bondi, so I go to the beach a fair amount. Um, walk my dog, go go play in the waves. Um, definitely something athletic related. Nice, nice. And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go one step further. What's the accent? Uh American. And I don't know why Americans say Cup of Joe. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, that's all right. It's just one of those things that's popped into it. Why is it called that? Don't know. Well there you go. It's someone from America. So how long have you been over here in Australia? Twelve years. Twelve years. All right. I'm Good. way more American than, than I am, but uh <laughs> No, uh, nice, nice. All right, very good. So, I guess to get a start point on all this, um, I guess do you want to give me a a one hundred and one understanding for everyone as to what open banking is all about. Now, I've um, uh, interesting. I've had uh, quite a few conversations with Senator Jane Hume that I know very well, and. Uh, uh, it's been a conversation Jane and I've had uh, quite recently on some of the nighttime Zoom calls with politicians that are being had of late, or were during COVID anyhow, and most of them were at night time, which uh, was fun, but not, but anyway. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting little piece. Uh, so give, can you give us that basic understanding? Just talk us through what this whole thing's about, because you hear about AIM for banking, you hear about blockchain and all this other stuff, and I must admit, I sit back. Maybe I just get a bit old and said, "Oh, I sit back and go, I just don't get it." <laughs> Tell me about it. Absolutely. So, open banking doesn't have anything to do with blockchain. Um, so, oh. it is. Yeah. So, we'll, we'll separate that. Um, let's say so. Open banking. It's a regulated data sharing ecosystem um, that only went live um, about two years ago, and it, it basically. Is, is a total transfer of um, power in the concept of data ownership. So traditionally, if you bank with, say, you know, call it Westpac, ING, and if you want to switch to a new bank, or if you want to open up, um, um, if you want to switch your home loan, um, if you said, oh yeah, hey, can you give me all of that, all the data that you have on me, um, I'll give, oh, give me my address book, all my payees, and give it in a digital form so, so I can set it up somewhere else and really make it easy for me to switch. They're like, nope, that's our data, and you can't really take it with. Um, so now the concept of consumer data right is you as a consumer, you, can, you actually own all that data on you, and companies just hold it. So yeah. Westpac, so if you want to switch from Westpac to ING, it's, um, you can actually just do it just in a couple of clicks. Just move all your payee information, customer, seven years of transactions. There's a whole lot of information that you can do purely digitally. So um, it's a compliance project for the banks that have to make data sharing available. Um, they have no say in, uh, say in it. Um, but it, where, we, where we come in, we're a technology enabler 
for data recipients. So basically, those are the companies that are regulated to receive the data. So, uh, yeah. just, just staying with the banks for a moment, um, mm -hmm. all the banks now share their data through open banking? 95.1% uh, of, uh, of, of banks do, as of, as of this morning. Right. So I think there's, there's 92. Yeah. So, because I can remember conversations going back before COVID where they were trying to get uh, the transparency of data onto a platform. Now, going back, I don't even know what the platform was, but I'm assuming it's an early form of open banking. And they were struggling to get like 40 or 45 percent of data up or something. And, and the banks and so on were pushing back against it. Um, it sounds like that's all a bit in the past. Is that because of regulatory intervention or, or what? What's that little journey like? Exactly. Um, I think that you, there's two different models of open banking worldwide. One is market driven. That's when a company like Plaid, um, you might have heard of them in the news because Visa tried to buy them um, and it fell through. Um, they, they actually somehow got all the banks to, um, to open up their APIs and, and give Plaid access. Um, so that's market driven, um, but we have a very regulatory driven um, access model here where the government says, yep, hey, all you banks, you're going to make your data um, sharing available and it's going to be done in these timelines and in this format. So it's, it's connected through APIs, are they? Is that yes, the, how? Yeah, it's only API driven. So it's like machine readable formats. Yeah. OK. Uh, and. So again, we'll come back to a 101 position for those that aren't involved in technology. APIs is a piece of, the, um, I like to say it's a piece of code that enables transfer of information. Is that sort of it? Yeah. Um, so if you want to get data from one um, place to another, say call it from Westpac to ING, an API okay. is bridge. Yeah. Okay. It's an application programming interface. It's a bridge for code. <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Okay. So out of the 92 or 90, we have many percentage of people had, who are the outliers? Are you allowed to say? Who's not playing uh, games? It's, it's all public information. You can see who's there, who's not. Um, you know who it is? I am fairly certain that I think it might be Bank of Queensland. Oh, really? Um, yeah. yeah and then, no, there, there, there's a couple um, that are past their regulatory obligations, but then there's a number of others that have some, some exemptions. So they might yeah. be doing a banking upgrade, so they, they wouldn't be able to do that major project and make data sharing available. I imagine, I imagine then having to write API coding, which in my head, and maybe it's because of my living experience, seems to be a relatively new thing. And that could be like five years or 10 years, but. It's not like it's been there for 30 years that they'd write APIs. Would that be right? Uh, yeah, I think that you're, you're, you'll see it like the, you see it like really enabled in, in the processes. Um, right. Because like because before, um, you know, like you, you might use APIs, but you know, like you might use something really custom or, or manual as well. And now you just want to automate and standardize things as much as possible. So that's why APIs are really, really useful. Um, well, we, so you can, instead of throwing people at the problem, you can throw technology at the problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, we use APIs all the time here in various things we're doing, which is why we can get a membership approval done in uh, basically 30 seconds from finishing all the data. Uh, it's all driven through APIs and, and the like. Um, but um, you know, where I was going, I, I was just curious, because to me, the, the, the conversations around APIs is relatively new, um, as in a conversational piece when you're doing things. I can remember building pieces of tech back when I was in private banking in the uh, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, I never heard that terminology then. Maybe I wasn't close enough to it. Um, but if the banks are trying to build APIs to be able to share data, I imagine that would have been hugely problematic with their legacy systems to try and actually get these things to walk, uh, to walk and talk with each other. Would, would that be right? That, that's absolutely correct. So core banking platforms, there, there's, I, I think that there's really kind of like one that's really developed um, uh, in, in this millennium. So they're, they're traditionally um, more legacy. They're, they're used to ingest data. 
um, yeah. you know, and manage the customer and the banking relationship. They're really not designed or built to um, export data, especially from a regulatory framework. So it's been a really big project um, for the core banking platforms to make their data sharing available. Yeah, I imagine it would be hugely expensive too from a banker's point of view, although they still post billions of dollars of profit every year. Anyway, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, well, it, it is it is really expensive, but um, well, of course, you know, if you're an ADI, you have to you have to comply with the same legislation. So, whereas they like uh, like a, one of the big four, they might have 200 people working on an open banking project, whereas some of the mutuals, they might only have you know like maybe two or three or four people in their tech team for the whole for the whole bank, and they have to comply with the same like legislations. So it's it's definitely been a big challenge for them. So who's the minister? Is it Jane Hume? Yeah, it is. It is Minister Hume. Good. good. Jane. She's all right. She's a good person. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, great. So then we start, you know, to me, that's the open banking test. I'm trying to connect the dots on all the different lingo that goes on with this. So we have open banking. Now I've got to grasp that. It's not blockchain. Can you tell me what blockchain is? you got a handle on that? Why, why, why is it not blockchain? Oh, I don't know what um, blockchain is. You can never explain it to me. <laughs> um, blockchain is basically an immutable record. Um, so it definitely isn't as fast as what you'd need for like processing for open banking. So it works for things like cryptocurrency or like um, how blockchain can apply to law. So if you want like um, like a record of everything that's happened. So if you say do stuff for escrow or contracts or like working on all the steps in that, that's really important. Or important about just being like, all right, what's what's the log of events and how can we um, and how can we monitor what's happened? Yeah. So so it's actually it's not very important for open banking. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, interesting. So. The other piece that we uh, hear all about is consumer data rights, CDR. Yeah. So how does that play in regards to open banking or is that the legislative piece that gets the consumer um, comfort it's okay to release this information because there's a legislative framework around it or, or what, what's it about? Yeah, so the consumer data right, that's like, um, that's the overall regulatory framework. Um, and it's it's like the first of its type in the world because um, where say in the UK they say yeah we we do open banking um, it's just data or it's just banking data whereas Australia it's actually like really forward looking where they said consumers you know it it it, um, it gives them the ability to control and move their data economy wide. Open banking, or like banking is the first industry that it applies to, where you can say, oh, I'm gonna share my banking data, and you might do it with a mortgage broker, or a budgeting app, or a, a new bank, or a new non-bank lender, you can share it with really whoever you want. Um, but with consumer data, right, it really shows the government's commitment to saying, all right, well, first it's banking data you have to share. Now next, now in October next year, it's energy data. So you can imagine like now it's really about competition. It's about choice. It's about proactive offers. Um, after that, it's going to be energy. And Minister Hume's going to be announcing soon um, the, uh, what, other, um, what other industries will have to share their data. So they have to go through this compliance project, but ultimately consumers are the ones who actually win. Because if you say, oh yeah, I can share my insurance data, but if you think, well, why would I want to do that? because instead of just getting um, or looking at my insurance once a year or once every few years, um, now we can have maybe switching as a service. So I share my data and instead of being reactive to new deals, we can, um, we can have a service that's always looking out for new deals and can, and can switch um, between yeah. providers. So it will probably be insurance, superannuation, payments, retail, like I, I get really excited about the different use cases. So, but yeah, but CDR is economy wide. Open banking is just the first cab off the rink. Right, but but CDR is basically the legislative framework, the law as mm -hmm. such. Would that be fair to say in simple terms? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so so we now got CDR right. So it came back to open banking then, um, or, or where this is going to travel. You're talking about energy and so on. Um, 
what is it that's a part of CDR at the moment? What, what is it that, that is actually on this platform that's working? Open banking. Um, I remember seeing a piece of uh, uh, comment, or not commentary, it was uh, a, a, probably the right word for it, it was a, a stakeholder engagement document uh, talking that there was a stage process that this would go through. And uh, it was sort of like it was um, bank account details first, then it was um, personal loans, and then it was sort of home loans. And, and, and it's sort of, sort of working through a checklist of things in some sort of order. Is that the case? And is, is that progressed if it is or? Yeah, so that's exactly right. So it's, it's, a, it's a phased approach. Um, yeah. Just because if you, if you told banks and say, oh, on day one, I want you to make all your deposit accounts, your TVs, savings, credit cards, personal loans, mortgages, um, complex business accounts, you know, complex business loans, one design, all design, everything between, you'd never get started. The whole thing would just blow up. Um, so it starts with, all right, let's just make personal um, deposit accounts and credit cards available. A few months yeah. later, let's make personal loans and home loans. A few months later, let's have CMAs and just other different types um, of accounts. So it's, it's a staggered approach just because it's complex. It's a program of work. Um, it's, but, but I do appreciate the, um, like, you know, the, the staging of it. <laughs> Otherwise, so, I would just never get it. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah, it's big, and especially when you think of it from a tech point of view and trying to integrate that on a, on a total uh, banking uh, business framework, it'd be quite uh, quite daunting, I'd imagine. Um, so have they completed that process, or if not, where are they at in that process from a banking perspective? Yeah, so um, so the, um, the, like the non-big four um, banks have like really just started the consumer um, data sharing process. Yep. So uh, that started on July 1st, uh, November, um, like, well, November 1st, um, that's when they had to have, that's phase two for them, that's home loans, um, personal loans, uh, joint accounts. And then every few months they have to keep going. Um, the big four, it's interesting, they started 12 months earlier. So on November 1st, they just made business account um, data sharing available. Because everyone thinks about, oh, consumer data, right, that's for consumers. Um, yeah. But actually, it's for businesses and institutions as well. So um, even can enable things like real-time treasury. Like, what can you do with business account data instead of just consumers? Yeah, is consumer then the right word for this, or is it really referring the, to the consumption of data? Do you know what I like? I like that the consumption of data. But yeah, instead of it, probably wouldn't be a very good acronym. If, um, if you just called it like the consumer, business, and institution data, right? <laughs> Good. <laughs> but yeah, I, guess, I guess consumer is just all inclusive. Uh, but it's definitely not just for individuals. It's for all uh, different types of entities. I might have to have a chat to Jane when I next speak to her and suggest that we, we talk about this as the consumption of data rather than consumer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sure. They need to be brand. <laughs> it's, already, it's already in grey. We'll move on. Um, <laughs> uh, so. You, you touched a little bit on um, open banking with UK and so on, and I was over in Ireland just before, or the, the period before um, COVID hit, and uh, we had some people up from UK, and I'd been in UK a couple of years before that, um, all on uh, business research for, for industry and so on, and I chair an international federation for mortgage broking, so it's all sort of part of the dots that we connect to understand what's happening around the world so we can be better informed in what we do here. Um, and I remember the conversations from the guys in London, um, and some of them were Aussie guys who are doing um, open banking there. And uh, our friends who started the federation with me back in 2016 from Canada had grave concerns about open banking. Have you got any sort of feedback or thoughts? It sounds like Australia is almost market leading. The UK were always saying to us, um, although Australia is starting behind us, they will overtake us very quickly. And go beyond us. Is, is that sort of the gut? Um, I mean, I'm biased, but that's absolutely my, like my read of the situation for sure. So, um, the UK they did open banking first, and Australia had the luxury of looking at to see how it went. You know, essentially doing a little bit of a debrief. Um, 
<laughs> which um, which was actually done in like a government commission report. It's called the Review into Open Banking. It's about like, oh, what's happened over there? How can we make it better? How can we improve on it? Um, and then that's how it really set the structure for the Australian um, consumer data right data sharing model. Um, so there's absolutely some advantages to the Australian model, but there's still some really good things that we don't have um, that are in the UK. Um, so like right now we just um, access the data so you can read um, but it's called read access. Um, so you can, you know, I, I can look at both pending your consents, I can look at your um, customer information, account, transaction, product, and then after that, then you can analyze it and you can make it actionable for your products or services. Um, what's really cool about the UK and should be coming soon in Australia is that um, they can initiate payments. So you can actually ingest the data or access the data, um, analyze it, and then decide to maybe push or pull a payment off the back of that. So that's really cool. Well, only, only the banking system could do that though the consumer couldn't yes right? yeah, yeah yeah so like you as a consumer you can consent for it but ultimately it would be the payments aggregator someone like an asl or a costco or an indu you know some someone like that who, who would do that or a different payments company yeah my um my uh, regulatory expert who uh works very closely with us on all our government interactions etc has said to me should be customer data right <laughs> He's probably correct. Thanks, David. Shout out. Uh, as to the data, right? That is uh, probably very, very correct. Um, but like I said before, I don't think they're going to change anything now. It's all too ingrained. Um, interesting. Yeah, it, it's um, yeah. I, I'm really interested to to, to understand because I one of the things I didn't quite understand, and I'm not saying that you do either, but, but you may have a feeling about this as to why Canada was seeing this or talking, being so averse to this, um, scared of it almost, and uh, it was going to be a problem. And, and yeah, they, they just seem to have this great amount of negativity to it. And we're very similar to Canada. Our journeys are very similar, our sizes and populations, uh, all of that sort of things are very, very similar. Not completely the same, but um, yeah, they just had this real adversity to it. I, I don't know if you've heard anything within the industry and the circles that you move as to why Canada might be feeling a little bit shaky about this, or is it just a Canadian thing? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm grouped right on the Canadian border, so I feel like I, I was kind of grouped in with the Canadians. Um, I imagine that it would just be a whole lot of the un, the unknowns, um, because they've talked about their open banking model or consumer data right model, but they haven't acted on it yet. So I think that there's actually so many international companies like international data companies looking at Australia because I we, I, we really think that Australia is going to be um, like the, the first implementation of consumer data, right? And other, in other countries are going to essentially just like more or less copy it. So looking at New Zealand, they've just announced that the, you know, like the consumer data right over there, um, Canada, that will be, I, I, I imagine that they'll really adopt the Australian model, even companies, or sorry, even countries like Brazil. Um, so the same way that, you know, for payments, like tap and go and contactless payments, really like Australia was a testing ground. The CDR will be the testing ground for the world here. But oh, wow. for, for Canadians, like I imagine that it's probably scary not knowing about it, not knowing, you know, what the regulation is. And you can always think of, oh, well, what's going to happen with my data? What, it, you know, as soon as there is a data breach, then you lose all credibility. Um, so how can you protect against that? But as soon as there's regulatory frameworks in place, then they're honestly really conservative. Um, yeah. and, it's like, and they really weigh towards the um, like consumer privacy and data protections. Like we essentially have like the Fort Knox of data security in my company. But I think that that's, that's what consumers should be expecting. That's what you should demand. Um, you like, that's a really important point because this is all about sharing your personal private data with someone in a system through technology. And, and I guess in one respect, I can understand Canada's concerns to a degree because you, you're sort of hoping that somebody, no one steals your data, there's identity theft, there's account theft, there's financial you know, benefits for, that people could uh, just bolt away with and take your money sort of thing. Um, do you think the legislation has this 
well and truly tied up in the manner of it should be, or do you think there might be some things that still need to be looked at? Is it pretty uh, good? Jane's not listening, so don't worry. No, <laughs> she's uh, she's got up in the house, so it's okay. <laughs> no, if if anything, um, I think that it's like really conservative, um, and um, and and they've really balanced um, like towards towards security protections and things being really, really tight. So often if you like Google Open Banking Australia or consumer data rights, um, there's lots of opinion articles that saying, you know what, it's actually, this is this is so intense, it's so secure, that it's actually really hard to be a data recipient. It's, it's actually too hard, it costs too much money or, too, you know, or, or it takes too much time. Um, that's where AdaTrade comes in. We, we, we handle the security, but make it really, really easy. So like, like I'm first, like I personally think that it should be difficult. It should be a privilege to handle someone's data. Absolutely. You read about breaches all the time. Like, gosh, how many times you get an email and you're like, oh, your password's breached. Just, you know, your data's around. That shouldn't happen at all anymore. And it, and it even goes further to say, you as a consumer, you have the right to say, you know, oh, you can share your data, get a product, get a service. That's great. And when you withdraw your consent to sharing data, because it's not forever, you can say, no, oh, thanks. Like, you know, thanks for that analysis. Thanks for that budgeting app. I'm done yeah. here. Delete all my data. And oh, that's, that's, that's what you right. That consent piece you just mentioned then. Um, so when you give consent, uh, there may be levels to this, but I'll be interested in your thoughts. Do you give consent for one transaction, for all information? forever for a period of time what, what does that look like yeah so so consent is very prescriptive on like what the process is going to be because you will never be duped like with the cdr you will never be duped into sharing something you didn't want to uh, at all so it, it really starts with like the product overview and say oh you're like say let's call it let's call it a home loan or a mortgage broker right and I say oh we're gonna um let's say let's say yellow brick road for you know for example purposes and then say oh we're going to share your data with um with yellow brick road for the purposes of finding you the most suitable and best home loan in market um and so it has to be for a specific pur purpose if say you shared your data and someone um you know made you marketing offers off of it or something you didn't consent to they're in a whole lot of regulatory trouble so it's purpose-based first of all and yep. then we say oh to, to do this this is the type of data that we have to collect so you know ultimately there's a whole big list of types of data but you can only collect what directly relates, relates to the purpose and they can't collect anything else what are the, um, are the big penalties involved oh, oh gosh um it's it, there's um it, there's like millions of dollars of of fines per breach and it's for corporate but also civil so if you're the accountable person you better like do like realize that, you, that your company's doing the right thing so it's really like the 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 stakes are incredibly high and so you'd only get a ticket to play if you're going to do the right thing because because if they're not it makes a mockery the whole thing and and you know, like for brokers their breaches of the best interest duty is a million and fifty dollars, um, and there's twelve different breaches. Um, one breach is enough to send a lot of people bankrupt. Uh, from a yeah. banking point of view, they just scoff that off as a speeding ticket. You know, um, and the bucks means nothing. So if the fines aren't measurable um, to the size, if you like, of the the consequence of what's happened by breaching this to someone that's, uh, like I said earlier, making billions of dollars of profit, yeah, you know, my concern would be is that they're just going to scoff it and say, oh, you know, we got a $20 million fine, oh, who cares? Um, you've seen major banks over the years, and you would probably recall this, is breaches the AMLCTF Act through ATMs and talking about fines of $800 million. Yeah. Um, so if it if it isn't sizable, um, it just gets laughed off. Um, so I'm kind of hoping it's, it's, a, it's a good whack in the back of the head if, it, <laughs> if they do, because it's everybody's data. Um, and the first steps will be the most um, nervous for people. 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The first time that you go through it, you'll be like, oh, what, what is this? But there's so much transparency. Like um, we actually, or, so we actually brought a use case to market on um, the first finance, non-financial services use case, um, just because we're regulated ourselves and well, just because we could. So it was called COVID hotspot alerts and it, um, it was a data for good initiative. So share your data. Um, Share, like choose to share your data with us and we will um, we will analyze it only for the purposes of sending you a real-time alert if you um, shopped it somewhere that is a hotspot because yeah. often you might know four days after and you just want to be informed so when we launched this um, people were definitely asking they're like what do you do with my data like mm -hmm. how do I know you're not selling it? Yeah. Um, it and and so we're like well we're not like the, the the short of it is we promise we're not because we're regulated. The long of it is read 267 pages of le legislation that says all the reasons that why we can't. Yeah. Um, so let's have a talk about Attitree and mortgage brokers because we've got a few hundred mortgage brokers listening in at the moment right around the country. This goes onto our YouTube channel. People are going to watch it for a minute a day. We've got a whole, whole, whole host of eyes on us at the moment. Um, so I better, better talk about them for a little bit. Um, talk me through what Attitree does and how you see that's going to potentially benefit mortgage brokers and then what we're going to do. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so Adatree, we are an Australian open banking technology company. So we take the hardest part of the consumer data right, which is getting all that really secure access, like to all the data from every ADI in Australia, um, and like in credit card brands. Um, well, you, have with, sorry, you get all that. Yeah, get all we do. Wow. It's really, really difficult, but um, but yeah, so that's what we've been working on for two and a half years. Um, we get the data, we store it, we can categorize it for you, and then we give it to our clients. So right now, our clients are regulated. Um, so we're, we're essentially like the the secure workhorse um, because all, all you want to do is get the data and you know and solve a problem for your customers. So yeah. the same way that you know if you just want to make a presentation, you don't go build PowerPoint. You license it from Microsoft. Um, so it, we're essentially the PowerPoint of open banking. <laughs> <laughs> Good analogy though, I get it. it makes sense in my head. Um, yeah. So is if it I'm a mortgage for companies to build it themselves, if you can just license it for way, way, way cheaper than, you know, than what it would take for you to do it. Yeah, yeah. So how do you see that this could potentially benefit mortgage brokers? Yeah, for, so for mortgage brokers, um, I would see it as having seamless access, totally digital and totally verified data um, to to your clients' accounts. So um, whether it's, you know, all the different types of um, accounts that they have, deposits, loans, um, and everything in between. Um, and then across from all, like all the different um, at ADIs. So instead of saying, oh, I want statements or, oh, can you download a CSV and share it with me? Or, or I think like some, some companies might even use screen scraping, which is, which is password sharing. That's, you know, that's unregulated data sharing. I won't even go into that. That's super bad news. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, it's like the seamless digital data collection. So this is the next evolution in the process that the data sharing capabilities for open banking, instead of doing the old things, as you say, uh, asking customers for statements or uh, screen scraping or uh, one-time access sort of stuff, that very quickly is the dark ages sort of thing, is it? This uh, is absolutely. absolutely. And then so so you don't ever have to you know worry about like, oh, the statement from there looks so different from the statement from here. Yeah. Um, we like we aggregate it across, you know, so whether you get access CBA data or uh, Southern Cross Credit Union, you get it in the exact same format. So you can yeah. actually make it actionable and, and start to compare and look for suitable and good products for, for your clients. So basically, whatever the um, obligation is to give consent is just one consent. It doesn't, it's the same consent, whether it be in this instance, a, a CBA, ANZ, NAB, IMB, Macquarie, it's the same consent form? 
Would that yep. be? Yeah, exactly. And it's all digital. I, I mean, it yeah, takes yeah, yeah. me probably like 30, 30 seconds ish to do it. Because you, you start and you say, oh, I want this data, then it redirects you to the bank. And then you just basically do um, a login, no password sharing, and then you confirm on that end, and then it redirects the data um, straight back. So what's really good about mortgage brokers is that there's this new regulatory model that is unreal. Uh, it's called trusted advisors. So it, it basically acknowledges all of like, you know, all of the framework, the structure, the regulation of so many professions right now, like mortgage brokers, auditors, lawyers, um, gas agents, tax agents. So companies who are like, we already receive data. We already provide services. We don't want to be regulated by someone else. Yeah. So just trust us that we're good at what we're that what we're doing. We're already regulated. Um, so now they can get um, so as of February they can get um, CDR data um, without being accredited. So they do that by partnering with someone like AdaTree. We get all the data. We just have to verify. Say, oh, are you a mortgage broker? Um, yeah. so go through a super quick verification process, and then they can get all the data. Sure. So. I will imagine, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and you're talking about the trusted yeah. piece now, but we're, we don't use the uh, A word for in the broking sector because uh, we work under credit assistance, uh, not advice. Uh, but I know where you're at. And I had this discussion with Jane a few weeks ago that um, I'm assuming then you can only share or give access to that data, whatever the right terminology is, with a mortgage broker who uh, and not a finance broker. Now, the split being a mortgage broker operates under fiduciary obligation by law through a best interest duty. A finance broker does not, right? They yeah. have no best interest duty. So it's really only for mortgage brokers at the moment. So it's so it's very it's very specific for the list of who is um, a, a trusted advisor. So even like um, I think financial um, financial advisors are also included um, yeah. on the list. But yeah, so right. absolutely. Well, mortgage brokers. In our industry, we're talking mortgage brokers, not finance brokers. That's correct. Okay, because I did argue that with her unsuccessfully. She won. Uh, <laughs> because I thought it was unfair that a big section of our marketplace was being disconnected from this, but she very aptly explained it was that fiduciary obligation under law. Yeah. Was yeah, absolutely. But the really good thing about this is that, like, oh, you'll probably never hear someone <laughs> say this about government before. Um, with CDR, it's constantly changing, and the government is honestly listening. So yeah. we, you know, we've absolutely given feedback and they have consultation papers. We're like, this works. This doesn't work. Oh, did you realize with this rule, you're actually blocking this? So there's yeah. consultations often, which is a fair amount of effort for us to read and you know respond to it, but they're always making changes. So it's actually like quite agile in, in their response because, it, because they want to make CDR work for different professions and, and lots of different consumers. Yeah. It, um, it is something that we have quite uh, uh, loudly expressed, but uh, we understand and uh, it'll be inter interesting. Yeah. But, but first things first, this is new. It's a, as you said, it's a staged approach from day one going back years, regardless of access or anything like that. So I guess we'll consider this as a part of the stage release uh, uh, going forward. So um, with Additree, FBAA and so on, what's, what are we going to look at? How how are people going to be able to access your services? Are we FBAA and uh, Additree are going to come together and uh, play games so that uh, members can get access to your services, go through your process, of course, but um, we can continue further conversations and educational pieces around this. Because to me, there's a lot of ongoing education with this as well. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a lot to unpack, whether it's about what is the consent process? What does that really look like? If you have the data, oh, how does this work with my existing processes? Because you know, some people might do it manually and collect it and do income and expense verification, but imagine that others have you know software. So how can you just pipe it in really securely? So I think that there'll be a number of different um, ways to approach it. But the good thing is that like 
we you know we have um, the API <laughs> for for all of the financial data. We have the consent framework. We've done all the hard part. So all we have to do is really plug it in and see like and see how it works. So this is February we're talking about, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, so um, obviously to uh, our our members and to people listening, and we'll talk a lot more about this before we get there. Uh, I think, uh, and we'll keep people up to date with what's happening because um, it sounds great, brilliant to me. I mean, I have been saying to the market actually for nearly a couple of years now, but it keeps reinforcing itself regardless of what happens, is that although we may be somewhere between 57 and 60 percent market share of loans originated through the broker network, I firmly believe we should be plus 70 percent. The UK is. Um, and I think that there's a reality that with the best interest duty and technology has always been my comments, we got a potential reach of 80% market share in the future as banks close branches or the branches are really plastic screens with somebody helping you key in something into a terminal. It's, there's no loans officers anywhere or anything like that. This to me is a part of that technology solution. And uh, I think it lines up a very interesting future for our industry as we step forward. I'm really excited about it. Um, does any of this play into the settlements arena or is it purely data collection, say, for an application for something? So right now it's it's definitely for the like the data access and um, and data collection for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, so not sure how it would play into settlements just because um, just because payments aren't officially a part of the, the CBR, but um, but hopefully it will just tackle a, a, a big initial, you know, a, like a problem or at least task to to get the data in a uniform way and and really expedite your decision making. So that that settlement piece does that fall into the blockchain area with the audit trails and so on? Or no? no I I definitely heard of um, companies um, using blockchain for that. I think, but I think it's a nice to have. I don't think it's totally necessary for it. Okay, interesting. Interesting for you. I love where we're going with this industry. Hey, guess what? I got a message. I found out what a cup of joe's all about. Love so, it. What is it? I had two people text me on this now, and uh, soon I said that uh, although there are many theories, one that is that seems to be the most common is that the uh, it says that Joe is used in the average Joe, so the average man or the common man, and therefore a cup of joe is the common man's drink. That seems to be the common consensus that, that's the that makes sense. Mandarin. that sounds good i like that so what's tea oh we won't americans, go there we might upset some people no. if I think in their mind. <laughs> no americans don't drink tea no way they're, good. they're, they're tough it up that's um <laughs> <laughs> in fact now for me one of the burning questions i have touching on what i was talking about just beforehand where's the future of all this where does it go to what is it any idea of what that 10, 15, 20 years out could look like with what's being built now? And I mean, technology seems to be moving so quickly. I mean, that uh, you know, 100 years ago, you know, we didn't even know what was. I, I remember my first mobile phone was a brick I carried off a sling around my neck, you know, with a big battery and this enormous bloody uh, handset. Um, everything moves so quickly. But what's the future look like? Is there any sort of thoughts as to, in your mind, where this could go to? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that at least like from a consumer perspective, like the idea of having like PDFs or, or paper or even forms, I think that that's going to be, um, you know, totally of the past, especially with CDR, um, you know, and knowing your history across whole wallet, across so many institutions, it's verified and so much of it can be pre-populated and all you have to do is really, you know, check it and confirm and go ahead. Um, I'd love to see settlement um, times going from like, you know, like, what was it like six, eight weeks down to, you know, like, why, why couldn't you do it in a fortnight with, with so much automation? Well, um, yeah. yeah, and especially with so much data. Um, it's really even like, um, uh, like questioning the, the idea of, you know, like credit models uh, in, in the future, instead of thinking about what's, well, what's a credit score that, that was invented in the 70s. Um, but but if you were like there's there's AI based companies like Upstreet in in the US that are saying they don't they don't need credit scores anymore. I know it's important to me for defaults or what's credit worthiness, and I have all your data and your behaviors. So let's have like a new age of of credit. Um, 
that's yeah. actually behavior based because it, you know, if, if a credit agency gives you a certain score, you know, this versus that, you actually don't know how they weighed up. You don't know what's important to them. So it's actually quite arbitrary. Um, so I think like the, like the concept of how you evaluate someone's credit is really interesting. Like even in some countries, they, they look at even your phone data to say, oh, how often do you, you know, how often do you like call your parents or call the same people regularly? How often does your phone go out of battery? Like look, those type of behavior, that's not involved in the CDR, but I think it's like look at totally new models on, you know, like reliability, like how, like in how you extend credit to people. Yeah. Yeah. So I, th th that's like quite like forward looking, but I think overall, at least for um, for for home loans, I think that you'd be able to have um, just look at suitability, um, like just just much more much more closely, and then you really have proactive offers as well. Um, so instead of just coming to the broker and just being reactive, how can you have an ongoing service and say, oh, you know, like. Hey Zach, I know that. Um, oh, I can see that you know you're earning more money now. Oh, do, maybe let's pay off more on your variable. Or here, here's a here's a great rate in market for you that really suits your circumstances. Let's switch you and have you refinanced in you know a couple of hours or a day or so. And that, that's my point. Banking could go and, and deliver to us. Absolutely. How exciting is that? Oh, that's okay. brilliant. I get, I get really excited about it. Ultimately, if you can save people money and get rid of their life admin, that's a huge win. Oh yeah, yeah exactly right, exactly right. Hey, um, you must be extraordinarily busy. And, and I know we all live busy lives. How do you find time to take a break or to have a holiday? What's what's your secret? We have somebody who sent us a, a question around that and I thought, well, uh, I thought I might just uh, ask you, I know I have my thoughts on it, but how do you find when you're doing something like this, which um, in one respect is relatively new, but has this ginormous future in front of it, um, where do you find time to have a holiday? How do you find time to have a holiday or to have a break? What's the secret? Yeah, um, I definitely plan ahead. And before I never used to take time off at like Christmas, but now it's like, all right, like let's have, I'll take my time off when everyone else has their time off as well. So that, that really works for me. Um, but otherwise, just planning it, planning it ahead, because ultimately, like, this isn't a sprint; it's a marathon. And if I burn myself out, then it's not good for my company, my employees, my team, um, my customers. So we just have to like really listen, take a mental health day, um, you know, when when needed, and and just have that balance. But otherwise, if I take a week off, obviously the the team is there to. Um, well, nothing's going to fall down in a week, of course, and uh, and the team is very knowledgeable to to help. But I think without that really strong team around me, I would probably really struggle. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. It, um, I always uh, sort of take January off and uh, try and find a week to, to go slow during the year. I didn't do it this year and I'm paying the price for it. I, I can see that light at the end of the tunnel. It just can't come quick enough. <laughs> but it, it yeah. is hard when... You know, I was running my brokerages in the past. I went, I think I, we were talking earlier, I think I went 15 years. I think it was, it was probably more like eight years. It probably seemed like 15 years, but it was, it was close enough to eight years without a holiday. So you just couldn't find time to do it. But I think um, the world's moved since then, when, and I'm going back quite a long time now, um, and that we're all more conscious of our mental well-being and physical well-beings. Um, and it's important that we take time for it. And yeah, you know what, we've got to plan that time. We've got to plan to do it, make sure we do it. And uh, if things get a bit tricky, then um, yeah, you're just going to have to have your mental health day and take catch your breath and go again. Because um, the reality of life is tomorrow, sun comes up again and everything keeps going. Nothing stops. New York, the yeah. city never stops. Uh, <laughs> no, I totally agree. I got another question come through for you. I'm not, I'm not going to name names in this, but a lot of the banks uh, offer systems uh, and services to brokers uh, to get bank statements, and they have certain platforms. Um, basically, open banking, if I'm right, is a replacement for that, but it's also a much more regulated environment compared to anything else in the marketplace. So it's, it is that evolutionary step forward. Would that, would that be right to say? Tell me if I'm wrong. My yeah, wife does. I think that, that that's exactly right. Um, it, it would definitely 
um, replace some of that um, because you know ultimately if um, if you're a consumer the probability of you having accounts only at one bank is, um, is would be pretty low well, it's often you know you have your home loan here your you know savings account there your TV there and you know credit card somewhere else um, but yeah so I think it's it, it's just definitely a way to aggregate everything but you still get you get it uniformly um, in a standardized way and also really quickly as well. So it will absolutely be the evolution of so many systems uh, for transfer of data for sure. All right, excellent. Now I've got, a, I've got a couple of questions here I'm just going to quickly answer for some people that are watching for us. Um, don't go away, Jill, because I've got a final one for you as well. So I've got a, one question here is what's the future of the clawback policy? So brokers having their commissions clawed back. Um, and do feel being more fairly represented going forward. So um, people are concerned about clawbacks. It's a regular conversation for us, Jill, uh, in our industry about the commissions, the upfront commissions being taken off brokers because the loans terminate early. Um, and I guess with open banking as well, it will make uh, the fluidity or the access to credit easier at the same time. So um, for those uh, who are tuning in with us today, we are tackling that um, full on at the moment. Uh, over on my desk over there, there's one, two, there's three folders that is full of research that we've just conducted that I've sent to every politician and uh, regulator I know. And a big chunk of that talks about clawbacks, the way it needs to be reassessed and readjusted. And uh, hopefully we'll hear more on that very, very shortly. So we are continuing to, to fight that front. And uh, again, as, as things grow and obviously brokers are obligated under this best interest duty, that fiduciary obligation under law, um, you know, it may be that it, because of what we can see in the future through open banking, uh, that you know, at, at month 15, there's an appropriateness that says why this is in the client's best interest to move their home loan. And it can be done like that through open banking, yet the brokers are gonna lose their commission for it. So these things need to change, but this is an evolution. Um, the whole clawback thing goes back to the 90s, I think it is. Uh, probably the late 90s, so it's been a bit draconian. Needs, it was built for one thing, needs to be fixed. Uh, the other comment I've got here, people may not lock my answer on this, um, highlight what FBAA is doing to address AFCA uh, renewals. There was a piece in the media about AFCA and the way they were handling uh, license re uh, renewals of uh, uh, their membership fees that are an obligation under law. Um, there, it looks like there's a bit of tech issue went on there that some invoice may not have gone out, others uh, uh, you know, for some reason got hiccuped along the way. Bottom line is we haven't addressed it with AFCA. We had no need to. We spoke about it in the press. We've had no members come to us saying it's a problem. Although we did put out in the media, if any of our members do have a problem with AFCA, come and talk to us. I know the CEO directly. I also know the chair. Um, and the reality is pay your bill on time. Um, and if you've got struggling to do that, then talk to us and we'll get things sorted out. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I think AFCA have dealt with any processing issues that they had and uh, have tried to correct it as best as they can, but there's a lot of people to deal with. So probably some things fell through the crack unfairly, uh, but they're all being picked up. So if anybody's got any ongoing issues with AFCA and paying their renewal of membership fees, reach out to me and uh, I'll help sort it out. So it's all good. Now, back to you, Jill. So last question for you, or last, last piece of info. What's what's your uh, what's your tip for the marketplace when it comes to open banking? What to watch out for? Um, what piece of excitement is there for people there as the future evolves? Do you have any sort of closing thoughts around that? Sorry, right. um, no, no, um, I, I would I would generally say um, you know like just focus on like what you're really good at and what problem you're trying to solve. And you know, um, it's, like I always say that companies um, dive into gestion, not of starvation. There's always too many other things to do, and it, even with us, um, you know, like we we partner with companies that are excellent at what they do, it might be infrastructure, or auditing, um, or even just you know policy uplift. So, uh, so I would say focus on what problem you're trying to solve 
because if it doesn't bring a benefit to you or your clients, there's no point in doing it. I personally think that there's huge benefits to have. Um, then just partner with the experts who actually know what they're doing. You know, definitely don't try to build it yourself. <laughs> but um, you know, just because time is money and you really just care about solving problems for you and your clients. Um, it is a journey for sure. It is a transformation, but it doesn't have to be a huge, huge transformational um, project. It doesn't have to be that daunting. So. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, some exciting times ahead. I'm looking forward to get with the journey with yourselves and the FBAA. And I've got to try and get you up here soon too, because uh, we've got our conference coming up not too far away. And uh, in March, so we could have you guys here at least come and uh, meet some of the folk. But uh, we will speak a lot more before we get there. And uh, Jill, thanks so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've learned so much today. And uh, so thank you. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Appreciate Thanks. you being with Some wonderful questions too. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. We will talk very soon. All righty. Take care and uh, we'll see you then. All righty. As we uh, quickly finish off for this afternoon, um, next month, a couple of little changes. We're changing the time. Uh, so next month only, new time will be 10.30 a.m. AEST, so uh, Eastern Standard Time, not Daylight Savings Time, 10.30 a.m. for Q&A. And we're going to have Rimberger with us. And uh, we're going to be talking about some really interesting things to help you better manage your day and become more successful. So uh, I'm really, really looking forward to that one on the 16th of December. Remember, 10.30. But uh, you'll get promotion stuff before it happens. And of course, don't forget tomorrow, International Men's Day, we're going to have some fun. And uh, we've got the conversations, the people who are speaking tomorrow are just wonderful people, experts in their own right. So uh, yeah, tune in and have a listen, get onto the webinar, it'd be great. And also if you're in Sydney, we have an event coming up shortly on uh, the 7th of December, register, come and join us face to face, woohoo, we're back at it. And uh, well, we've always tried to be, uh, COVID's just created the hassles. Um, so face to face Sydney, register, click on the links and uh, come and join us. Be fun. Alrighty, don't forget, as I mentioned before, conference. So our 2021 conference is being held on the 11th of March, 2022, uh, because of COVID, you get that. Um, and at night time, heroes and villains, uh, get ready to dress up if you're that way inclined. And uh, during the day, fantastic content from around the world. You wanna make sure you wanna be a part of it. It's gonna be fantastic. Face to face at SeaWorld on the Gold Coast. So uh, come up and join us, it's gonna be a huge event. All right. Thanks again to our sponsors. We appreciate their support. They're wonderful people, and especially with Suncorp there on our mental health program. And uh, don't forget, you'll get a little survey after this is all finished. Uh, it'll give you your uh, code for your CBD points. And uh, again, that little survey, fill it out for us. It lets us know if you've enjoyed it or not, or if there's more things you want. And we appreciate your feedback. All right. That's us for another one. Take care. Be well. See you real soon. Bye for now.